I think uh, you've given us a perfect introduction to our first speaker, Sarah Sharples, um, uh, 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 ex-president, I understand, as of a few months ago, uh, of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors, uh, who I think, uh, and a professor from the University of Nottingham, uh, who will be able, I hope, to expand on that point as to how technology in itself is not the key point. In some sense, it's how it interacts with us, not just with us as individuals, but maybe with us in terms of legal structures, as Patrick already referred to. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary of State, for the introduction, and thank you very much to the Independent Transport Commission for the invitation to speak here today. Um, it's a real privilege to be here talking to you all about the relationship between technology, behaviour and travel choices. It's probably worth me mentioning that, as well as being a professor of human factors and um, that being my scientific discipline, I'm also based within the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Nottingham and, and actually direct the research across the faculty. And one of the things I'm very passionate about is, is as the Secretary of State mentioned, the interaction between people, between society, between our legal and our regulatory framework, between behaviour, between technology and between engineering. And it's, it's really apt that I'm doing this talk in the uh, Museum of Science and Industry that we're very privileged to have in London here. Um, because actually one of our jobs as professionals within universities and those within the transport community is to work out how to make the most of the capabilities of engineering, of technologies, and the capabilities of humans as well. So I'm going to be talking about um, the behaviours of humans, the influence of technology on that, and what our role is in terms of influencing these things. And it's not new that transport technologies have been influencing our behaviour. Um, it's been happening for decades. This is Surbiton Station. I grew up in Surbiton. Surbiton, as many of you will know, is a town that exists because of the railway, really. Kingston didn't want a railway. They were, they were very keen on coaches. And uh, so the main line from London Waterloo to Portsmouth went through Surbiton. And that technology shaped the town that I grew up in. It shaped my attitude towards technology, towards trains. I got a train set when I was five years old, and I think that's guided me um, in my life in the future. Our individual and our collective attitudes towards technology affect our individual day-to-day -day choices about behaviours. And as technologies change, behaviours and our opportunities for changing the way that we travel also change. So what we need to do is to understand the influences of that change, understand the speed of that change, understand what we can control, and what actually will be the will of the community, the will of the people. What are those emergent technologies, and what do we actually have a responsibility to engineer in some way? So I'm going to give you an example of a notion that we use within human factors. This is something that we call a desire line. A desire line is something that evolves as a result of human behaviour. As well as technology shaping our behaviours, our behaviours shape our technology. They shape the environment amongst us. And I want you to think about this notion that I'm talking about technologies and engineering. Because actually one of our jobs is to think about ways that we can spot the desire lines. How can we anticipate the desire lines? How can we design for the desire lines? And it's possible. This is an example, a Google Maps image, and you can just see here a desire line. So it was, it was so strong, it's picked up by satellite. This is University of Nottingham campus. Any of you who've been there, this is our flagship Trent building, the big white building with the tower that you see. And this is the behavior of people. This is the movement of people from the halls down here, the entrance down here, up towards the Trent building where many of our meetings and our lectures are held. So, what did we do when we saw this desire line? Well, this is now the map of the campus, and you can see it's no longer a desire line, it's a pathway. It's a beautifully engineered pathway. It's got plants around it, it adds to the user experience of the space. So, this is an example of where 
we've noticed the behaviour of people, and we've engineered in order to accommodate the behaviour of people. So how do we capture this behaviour? How do we anticipate this behaviour? And how do we understand the interaction between all of the system elements when we're looking at this behaviour? Transport is a complicated space. You're all completely aware of this. Um, I've just come down today from the Transport Systems Catapult, where I'm also a non-executive director. And the notion that the Catapult works around is intelligent mobility, the effective and efficient movement of people and goods through space. And you'll see here that, um, as the Secretary of State noted, um, we've had a trend in different types of transport use. So this is car and van use um, and walking. And they have gradually, since 1995 to 2014, this is the 2014 National Travel Survey data, the trend is that use is decreasing. But since 1995 to 2014, the use of surface rail and buses, particularly in London, is increasing. It's increasing in a transformative way. But transport is an incredibly complicated space from terms of the interaction between major infrastructure projects, personal device innovations, um, and expectations of users. We're also very, very affected by the normal behavior of people around us. And of course, we're very varied as a population. One of the things that it's really worth thinking about as well is the variety and the different types of journeys that we take. Um, some work that was recently done by the Transport Systems Catapult um, was a project called Traveller Needs that was a very large-scale survey looking at what people's needs for travel were now and what they anticipated they would be in the future. Um, there's lots and lots of findings from this report, and I, I recommend you take a look at it. But one of the most striking findings is that only 12% of journeys are ones where travellers actively make choices about their transport modes. So the remainder of those journeys are, are planned, routine journeys. If we think about our own travel and our own movement, many of those journeys, we, we, we always take the car when we go to Tesco. We always take the train when we go to London. And there actually is very, very little wriggle room for influencing that decision. People are slow to make behavior changes um, normally slow to make behaviour changes, although I'll talk about some situations where that changes. Um, but it's really important for us to think about what we can influence and actually be comfortable with the things we can't influence. I'm not going to cover all aspects of transport use today, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider some elements of behaviour that I believe are key for us to understand in terms of thinking about the motivations of people when they choose transport modes and when they travel. And then I'm also going to be thinking about what we can do from a scientific point of view in terms of understanding that further and influencing it. So the first notion that I'm going to talk about is efficiency or productivity. This is a picture of me on a train. And I choose to travel, particularly when I'm doing long distance travel, by train almost all of the time for work. And the reason is because, to me, that is productive time. That's time when I actually can work effectively, away from distractions, and I plan my work associated with that productive time. But people are different, so people have a desire to move around quickly. And productivity may mean different things to different people. Um, in fact, the Secretary of State has stolen two of my anecdotes, and this is the first one. So I think you talked about uh, a member of your family who, who increasingly cycles, and that's his, his sort of exercise regime. Um, and uh, actually, um, that's, that's very, very true. We sometimes choose to walk to the railway station or to walk between bus stops because it's our only opportunity for exercise during that day. That's productive travel. It might mean that your journey from A to B has taken longer, but if it's a productive journey, then actually just taking that start and finish time is a little bit crude. So in terms of capturing and looking at the effectiveness of our journeys and our transport systems, we need to not just think about travel time, but think about productivity and engagement during that time. But choices about productivity are not straightforwardly algorithmic in any way. 
people might choose to travel in certain ways because of the control they have over the environment. Some work we did at Nottingham looking at propensity to car share showed that some people love their cars. And they love their cars, and nothing we did in terms of reducing price of trains or um, providing end-to-end -end services that enable them to park more easily at the station would affect their decision about going in their car because they wanted to listen to their music. They wanted to have some solitude. They wanted to think through their day. They wanted to sit in their comfy seat. They'd invested money in their car that they loved. And actually, we mustn't be dismissive of that. We mustn't be dismissive of the emotional attachment that we have to our experiences in everyday life. So how can we influence this? Well, the first way we can influence this is to think about the way that we inform information. So we provide information in order to allow people to make an informed decision about the way that they travel. This information needs to be multimodal. This presents us with a challenge if we have a franchised or um, distributed travel environment. If we think about a train journey, the classic example of the end-to-end -end journey is that if there is one element within that journey about which we are uncertain, that may discourage us from that modality of travelling by train. And the example of parking is a classic one. If we want to travel by train, but we're nervous that we won't be able to park and we won't be able to get on the train in time, that may actually change the way in which we're making our decisions. But we also know that circumstances change this behaviour as well. At the time when we started our work about car sharing, um, it was a, a few years ago, and the volcanic ash cloud um, disrupted air travel quite dramatically um, for a number of days. And what we found was that in an event like that of extreme travel disruption, people completely changed their attitudes to their um, uh, choices about transport. For example, they were much more content to share journeys. They were much more prepared to um, embark on different routes because they were forced to by the disruption of their normal expected means of travel. So people generally take time to change their behaviour, but in some circumstances, people are able to change quite quickly. A second notion that's really important to our travel choice and travel behaviour is trust. Um, we've already had mention of autonomous vehicles. Um, trust is not just about technologies, it's also about information. Trust and automation has been a topic that people have grappled with for years from an engineering point of view and from a human factors point of view as well. We know it can be affected by people's experience, um, by their direct interaction with a system, one bad interaction can really sort of put you off if you don't understand what's happened when this button's pressed. Um, that can really sort of reduce your level of trust in the system. And the subjective norm that um, if everyone else is travelling in autonomous vehicles, we'll probably be happier to travel in them. But people vary in how they attribute trust to a system. And this is the second anecdote that you've, you've stolen from me, actually. So we're sometimes not necessarily rational in how or why we make decisions about travelling in different modalities. When we explicitly ask people, would you be comfortable to travel in an autonomous vehicle? They go, oh. and they say, well, would you go on the Docklands Light Railway? Oh, yeah. Victoria Line? Oh, yeah. Um, London to Nottingham train, oh, don't want that to be autonomous. Now, actually, from a technical point of view, there's not so much difference. And one of the things that we really need to understand is when it's appropriate to introduce fully autonomous systems and when, actually, we need to respect the need for people to have the physical presence of other people within the environment in order to reassure them um, and provide oversight of that technology. But that's a real challenge. We talk about ironies of automation. We can't realistically expect people to monitor the performance of technology that has been designed on the very basis that it's doing something better than the people were able to do in the first place. If we're designing technology that has better perception than the human visual system, it's not realistic or fair to ask a human to monitor that performance. So we really need to think about that. It's also really important to take a systems perspective when we're understanding when incidents occur. Um, 
we talked about the actually the quite exciting news that we're now at a point where we can ensure autonomous vehicles. The legal and regulatory framework about autonomy is, 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 is very, very tricky, but I feel quite passionate. It's important that we don't get defeated by that. We have to address it full on. We can't sort of go, this is a bit difficult, this is a bit dangerous. We need to think, right, this is a technology we want to use. How do we design the entire system in order to deal with this? And something that's really important is around attribution of blame. It's been very interesting that there's been a few minor incidents with autonomous vehicles so far. And I admire what the companies have done because they have published as much as they possibly can about those incidents and actually produced some quite good information about why they've occurred. Whenever an incident occurs, it's almost always a complex interaction of factors. Unfortunately, both as humans, and sometimes from the legal perspective, we have a desire to blame. And something that I would really implore people to do is to not just think about what the one individual fault is, but think about how the system components have combined in order to cause this particular incident. And not only that, but think about situations where the technology and people have combined to produce a good outcome, a resilient system. One of, the, one of the big problems we have is it's really easy to detect when an autonomous vehicle has had an accident. How many accidents have been prevented by vehicles being autonomous rather than by human controlled? Now, that's something that statistically is, is impossible to identify, but really important that we remember. So how can technologies affect this? And what's the role of people like me, of engineers, of technologists, of designers, of architects and human factor specialists? Well, the first thing we can do is we can design. We can design information to be accessible, to be personal, to be understandable. Uh, we talked about the data around bus travel. The Next Bus app that's used in London um, has transformed um, the attitude towards certainly um, the younger generation of using buses um, by providing real-time, reliable information. And our trust in technologies is affected by our past experience and by other factors as well. One of the notions we talk about is the user's mental model. Our internal representation of how something works influences our behavior, probably. We don't know, definitely. But, uh, but that's, that's one of the things that we use as the basis for our understanding of the impact of design. This could be through the design of a dashboard display, for example. It could be through um, the way that a planning or information application on our smartphone updates um, or represents information. One of the interesting challenges we've got is that as technology is increased, the visibility of the underpinning engineering infrastructure that we use has decreased. Um, I, I was never great with cars. I look and am bamboozled when I open the bonnet of my car now. But my first car had a choke. I understood that. I understood that that involved, I hope I haven't got this wrong, flow of fuel to the engine. Um, and, and, that, that, and I could see the direct impact of moving the choke and the behavior of the engine. That helped me form a mental model of how that system worked. It's really hard for us to form those mental models now. You may wonder why there's a bus sign on the, on the screen. I've got a mental model of how this works. We've got two types of information here, 12 minutes, 19 minutes, and then an absolute time. I have a mental model of how this works. I have a mental model because I've guessed, but I also have a mental model because I've read the information on the Nottingham websites and there's signs at Nottingham bus stations where we've got um, similar signs to this. And I'm assuming that Ayrshire used the same technology as Nottingham. Real-time information is presented here where we've got an actual number of minutes. Actually, this isn't real-time bus information. This is timetable information. That affects my choice about which bus I get on. So that's an example of good design because the different sources of information are represented in different ways. But it's not brilliant design, because I've had to read instructions in order to understand what the meaning of it is. So it's really important that we think about these sorts of things. So as well as taking into account the role of design, we can understand human capability. One of the things I say to my students is, humans are fallible and humans are brilliant. Some work we've done at Nottingham 
demonstrate human capability and human workload. Um, we know that people use their cognitive resources differently in different parts of a journey. Sometimes it's appropriate to give information in visual form, sometimes in auditory form. But one of the things that's happened with the advances of sensor technology and the development of sensor technology is that ways of measuring human capability in real time have developed way beyond what was feasible in the past. This is an example of a technology called facial thermography. And we're using it um, in conjunction with an aerospace company to see whether we could understand in real time pilot workload. Um, our results so far have shown that this region here of the face tends to get colder during higher workload. Um, now, that's something where we're still doing work to understand how reliable that is, how transferable that is. But actually, if we can get real-time understanding of the state of people responsible for transport infrastructure, that helps us to manage that infrastructure, helps us to intervene, for example, if people need more support, um, and helps us to understand actually how to effectively deploy people in transport control. We're also looking at physiological measures to understand how people respond as they move around airports so that we can actually present information in a different way depending on, for example, their level of stress. Um, so if I'm late for my, um, uh, for my departure gate, just giving me a big number five on my phone is probably more effective. If I've got half an hour to wait and I'm calm, I can get marketing information, um, I can be told where to relax and have a glass of wine. That's actually got an important underlying business model as well, and it's, it's very important that we recognize that. In addition to dedicated technologies, we must acknowledge that people appropriate technologies that aren't designed for the use within transport for transport purposes. The best example of this at the moment is Twitter. Um, we routinely see conversations like this between a traveler and a transport provider. And it builds up very useful sets of data for transport providers, but also has, has actually transformed customer service from those transport providers as well. Some work that we're doing is looking at how we can actually manage this data most effectively, and what do people take from this information? We know that actually the official data, the official responses, can be sometimes a bit slower than the responses from other passengers or other customers. How do we, how do we deal with that? How do we take that into account? But I think what we mustn't do is think we've got to design our own Twitter for travel. No, let's use the technology that's out there, understand how it's effective for us, and be a bit courageous about embracing it as part of our systems. But this does present some challenges. I don't know how many of you have come across Waze, which is um, an app that uses crowdsourced data to provide real-time traffic information as part of a satellite navigation system. Um, that's really effective, and people become real advocates of this type of technology. We're working with a local SME in Nottingham to look at how we can use GPS data to capture evolving bus routes in developing countries. So there's massive potential of this crowdsourced approach. But you can see it has some challenges here. So traffic-weary homeowners and ways are at war again. Guess who's winning? So this is about ways app users spotting different diversions through residential roads and incurring the wrath of those residents along the way. It's worth thinking, though, that we mustn't get too seduced by technology that is predominantly used by the younger generation because they're only a small part of our travel population. Only 59% of the population at the moment are active social media users, and they are age range dominated by 20, people from between 20 and 39. And this is not a number that's increasing. So the types of platforms that people are using is changing quite rapidly, particularly among young people. Um, and we must make sure that we don't exclude those who are not users of this technology. It's worth remembering that the iPad has only been with us since April 2010 worldwide. We've had a dramatic transformation in the use of technology in a very short space of time. And finally, it's really important that at transport specialists, we don't work in isolation. Travel and transport is part of our lives. It's part of our home. It's part of our purchasing behavior. And this presents opportunities and challenges. Um, it presents opportunities by combining different data sets, that's personal data, to build a real holistic picture of the behavior of people within cities and with um, future environments. Um, but it provides challenges in terms of the ethics and the privacy of using that data. 
Our aspiration should be, how can we use these technologies to inc increase individual productivity, collective productivity? Um, but how do we also do that in an ethical and responsible way? So I'll just, I'll just close by talking about our, our, final, our final sort of points. So rather than being daunted by the scientific, engineering, and social and ethical challenges, we need to encourage innovation. We need to face our ethical and legal challenges head on. And we need to understand that transport is about much more than physical systems or physical infrastructure. We need to think about how we can spot those desire lines, how we can anticipate behavior of users and work together with users, technology, and systems in order to deliver effective and resilient transport systems. Thank you very much.